So Mark 9, 28-36, where the Bible reads, Thank you very much. And he was come into the house, his disciples, Okay, I'm on verse 2 now. Mark 9, 2-13, um, through 13. And after six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John, and leadeth them up into a high mount, apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his raiment became shining, exceedingly white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. And there appeared unto them Elias and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. For he wist not what to say, for they were sore afraid. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. And suddenly when they had looked round about, they saw no man any more, save Jesus only with themselves. And when they came down from the mount, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen, till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. And they kept that saying with themselves, questioning one with another what the rising from the dead should mean. And they asked him, saying, Why say the scribes that Elias must first come? And he answered and told them, Elias cometh first, and restoreth all things, and how it was written of the Son of Man, that he must suffer many things, and be set up not. But I say unto you, that Elias is indeed come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed, as it was written of him, as it is written of him. Tonight we're going to be looking at the Mount of Transfiguration. Now we read from Mark, but there are two different recordings of this account, one in Matthew and one in Luke. When we come to these three Gospels, were all three written and recorded by disciples of Christ, of the inner, well, I don't want to say the, but of the original twelve. Were all the writers of the Gospel accounts part of the twelve disciples? It's not a trick question. We just got to jog our memory a little bit. Were the writers of the Mount of Transfiguration account all the, uh, of the original 12? You have on your paper that Matthew recorded it, Mark recorded it, and Luke recorded it. Now all of them were. Who was, do you know who was not one of the original twelve? Luke. Luke wasn't. Now I'm going to start pulling a little bit more and see how far I can go. What, where does Luke come into play as a writer of one of the Gospels? Later on, after Christ was already prison, I think he came in about Paul. That's exactly right, brother. Luke was not part of the original 12. He was a convert of the Apostle Paul. If we study out Luke, he was Paul's personal physician. And what makes Luke stand out amongst all the other writers of the Gospel, him being included, all of the other 39 writers, is Luke was something that they were not. Luke was a Gentile. Luke is the only Gentile author in the entire Bible. And he's the only one that was not there witnessing all these things of Christ. But rather, we go to the gospel, to the beginning of Luke, the very first chapter. The reason that Luke got these is he did some digging. He did some research, whether he talked directly to Mary, the mother of Jesus, because of 
Paul had connections with Timothy, which we're not going to go through all the listings that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was under the pastorship of Timothy due to John. But Luke had to do his research. Now, he could go to primary sources, being the original disciples, but he was not there on the mountain itself. But he wrote his gospel to persuade the office lead, the office, the office, I can't see. You can find his name in Luke chapter 1, but he was not there. So, But we do have him recording the account there of the Mount of Transfiguration. When we look at the Mount of Transfiguration, it is a reference to the Perugia, or Christ's second coming is what we know it as. It was recorded in three of the four Gospels. They're all right there in your notes, so if you want to go forward with it, you can look and read those passages and accounts yourself. When we look at the Mount of Transfiguration account itself, it reveals to us the nature of this present world. We didn't go into the full account of it. We read the part of the Mount of Transfiguration, but if we would have read a little bit farther, we would have found out that there was something happening at the base of the mountain as well. In fact, in the upper left-hand corner of your paper, there's a little blurry picture. That is the Mount of Transfiguration as painted by Raphael. And what makes his painting or artistry work of this account so magnificent that stands out among everything else is You'll see at the top half, Jesus Christ on the mount with Moses and Elias. But on the bottom, you see the base of the mount. And what's going on at the base of the mount is there's someone demon-possessed that you would find it as you read the account where Christ, while he has this mountaintop experience, as soon as he comes down, he has to deal with the trials and the tribulations of this present world. That a demon possession and taking care and coming up with the suffering and... Uh, the sickness and sin of this present world. And it reveals to us the nature of this present world as well, this passage does, because it reveals to us that you can be on the mountaintop with God, but all the while the devil is at the base of the mountain working. You can be shut alone with God, but the devil is still working somewhere that as soon as you come out of your prayer closet, or whatever it is, he's ready to present you with a situation. Now, there is debate upon which mountain does this actually occur. Some people will claim that it occurred on top of Mount Tabor, but practically everybody will agree that it wasn't Mount Tabor, but rather it was Mount Hermon. We based it upon these two passages. If someone would please read Mark chapter 8, Mark 8, and verse 27, and someone else read Mark 9, verse 14. Mark 8, 27. In Mark 9, 14. Some say that thou art John the Baptist, 
Some say Elias, which if we're saying Elias, do you know who Elias is? In the New Testament, they change the names to the Greeks. So we're familiar with the people. It's just a matter of figuring out who they are sometimes. Elijah. So whenever you see the name Elias in the New Testament, we're referring to Elijah. Elias and others, Jeremiah, which, who would Jeremiah be? Jeremiah. Or one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. So when we look at Mount Hermon, it's a place where Jesus had his Mount Transfiguration experience, but it's also believed that that is where Simon had his real big epiphany that Jesus was truly the Messiah. So let's look back into the beginning of Mark. Back to the passage that we're reading, Mark chapter 9 and verse 2. It begins with a phrase. Does someone want to read the first phrase of Mark chapter 2 and verse 9? What's that? Mark 9 2. And after six days, Jesus stayed, taken with him, Peter and James and John, and made them up into a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. Okay. When we look at the first four words of this verse, what are they? And after six days. Six days of what? What's this reference to? After six days, from what I could find in my Bible study, I couldn't find if there was a feast going on or what happened six days prior. A lot of people believe that the six days is a reference to the week itself. And it's six days from the Sabbath. So they were six days in the week, which means he's going up onto the mountain on the sixth after the, on the seventh day, so from Sabbath to Sabbath. So the people believe that Jesus was ascending on Mount Hermon on the Sabbath day itself. And this is also a reference back to Moses. If someone would please read Exodus 24, 9 through 18. Exodus 24, 9 through 18. Exodus 24 and 9 through 18. Exodus 24, 9 through 18. And Moses rose up and his minister Joshua and Moses went up into the mouth of God. And he said unto the elders, Carry ye here for, for us until we come again unto you. Behold, Aaron and her are with you. If any man have any matters to do, let, them, let, let him come unto them. And Moses went up into the mouth and the mouth covered the mouth. And the glory of the Lord opposed upon Mount Sinai. How many days did it cover it, brother? Six days. Six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like the 
fire and found fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moses went to the midst of the fire and he got him into got him up into the mountain. And Moses was in the mountain forty days and forty nights. So when we look at that six days, it's reminiscent and bring us back to that time of Moses. And just as Moses was there on six days and the seventh day, God came down, or Moses went and entered in. The seventh day, he called unto Moses out of the midst. We also see six days have passed, and on the seventh day, Jesus is up there on top of Mount Hermon and having the Mount of Transfiguration experience. So we cannot talk about the Mount of Transfiguration experience without talking about Mount, which we've already done, and the Transfiguration. Those are kind of the two of the big things right there in the title, Mount of Transfiguration. So you have to look at them. So when we look at the Greek word for transfigured, because if we go to chapter 9 of Mark and verse 2, it says, and he was transfigured before them. What does that transfigured mean? When we look at the Greek word for transfigured, it means metamorpho, which for us shouldn't be really that far of understanding or guessing what it is because metamorphosis. It's a changing. And that's exactly what metamorpho means. It's a changing, literally. A transfigured, transformed. Now this word metamorpho occurs in four different verses of the New Testament. We see it in Matthew chapter 17 and verse 2, with Mark chapter 9 and verse 2, which of course if we go back, those are the Mount Transfiguration experiences. Romans 12.2, let's read Romans 12.2, and if someone else would get 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. So Romans 12.2 and 2 Corinthians 3.18. Romans 12.2, 2 Corinthians 3.18. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove that which is good and acceptable. And be not conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed. What is that transformation process? It's a changing. You can't live, be, expect to play with the world and be like Christ. It's, it's a changing process. And be not conformed. Don't be like them. Let it loose of it. Have nothing to do with them. Come out from amongst them and be separate. And be transformed by the renewing or the changing or hitting the reset button of your mind. What about 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18? But we all with open face and morning as, as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So being changed, and that's where that word metamorpho is used in place of the, the word change has been translated from that. From glory to glory. So it's a changing, a transforming, no. a cleaning up, completely turned about. So it's being changed, transformed. Now, when we go back to this with Jesus Christ on the mountain itself, he says he was transport, transfigured before them, or changed, and his raiment became shiny exceedingly white as, as snow, so as no fuller of earth can white become, or what can white them. So when we're looking at this passage, Jesus Christ, there's something that was different about him. He was one way going up into the battle, but when he got up there, there was a transformation process that occurred. The Bible says that he became, his clothes became white as snow. If we would think about that a little bit, It'd be like a shining bright light. Is this the first time we see this in Scripture? Absolutely not. We've already had one throwback to that individual. And after six days, who were we talking about? Moses. Did Moses have a changing process about him when he came down after the mountain from being in the presence of God? Did he have something that maybe made him not necessarily white as snow, but there was a glow about him. 
a, we would say even a bright light. So much so that the people made him wrap his face because it was so bright. What's going on here? That's exactly what is happening. There is a transformation that is happening with Jesus Christ from not just being in the presence of God, but there is something completely different when it comes to Moses, um, Jesus. We talk about the transformation process, um, being changed from glory to glory, and be not come, become, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Where is that change starting? Where does that change begin? Is it on the outside or is it on the inside? It begins on the inside. Just like when it comes to Christianity, you, we all often say you can't skin the fish before you catch it. You can't bring someone to Christ and say, well, before you come here, you got to dress this way, you need to get rid of this, get rid of this. No, because Jesus is the one that changed them. Because if Jesus isn't the one changing them, it's just another religion to them. They haven't had their personal experience, but rather it's ritual and it's tradition for them. But the real change comes from the inside out. And that's exactly what we see occurring with Jesus Christ with this transformation. It is a reflection of what is on the inside coming out through him. It is the light of God. And when we look at Jesus Christ himself, he is different from every single human being that ever lived. With us, and even with Moses, the light that came forth came from the inward out. But the light that came forth from Moses, that wasn't his own light. That had to do with his relationship with God. He spent so much time in the presence of God that it permeated from the inward to the outward. The same thing is true with us. With be not conformed to this mind, but be transformed by the, re by the renewing of your mind. That is not us shining from the inside out. That is the glory of God that has been placed within us, shining out. But with Jesus Christ, did he know sin? Was he born into sin? No. He was completely different. He was the spotless lamb of God. So when we look at the Mount of Transfiguration, we are not necessarily seeing the working of God on the inside coming out, but rather we are seeing the deity of Jesus Christ being released. Because Jesus was 100% God. 100% um, man is where I'm going to start. But he was also 100% God. He is the only individual in all of time and space and matter that was the exact individual that Job longed for. That daysman redeemer. That I think I have that right. Where... That individual was worthy to place his hand on God's shoulder, but also worthy to place his own hand on man's shoulder and say, I will be the go-between. That was Jesus Christ. And what we're looking at, this is God, Jesus' deity being revealed from the inside out. Because when it comes to Jesus, just like us, what is on the inside is going to be revealed on the outside. We find that being true, to, true and also biblical. I can get to my notes where I want to go. In Matthew chapter 6, if someone would please read Matthew 6, 22 and 23. Matthew 6, 22 and 23. Matthew 6, 22 and 23. The light of the body is the eye. And if therefore thine eye be simple, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? So what is the window to the soul? The eye. What's the window to what's really truly on the inside? The eye. What's on the inside will eventually come out. And that is exactly what we see happening here with Jesus Christ. And it is the same thing that happens with us. Our relationship with either God or this world will come out on the outside. People will complain about the, um, Christianity being a bunch of rules and religion and have to dress a certain way. 
We dress a certain way because of what we have on the inside. We know that it's pleasing to God. We know it's what He commands us to do, and that's why we do it. We don't try to do it by ourselves on the outside because, guess what? We try to dress like we should according to the Bible, but our heart's not in it. It's only a matter of time before what's on the out inside is going to show up on the outside. And people will argue, well, the outside doesn't really matter. Just today, there's a family that I know of that I've seen their son on Facebook post pictures for quite a while now. But today, he plays right on his Facebook that he's in a relationship with another guy, even though he was not raised that way. But you know what? I kind of suspected it. Was it because I was talking to him all the time? No. He probably, he might know who I am, but he might not. But what I saw was a change on the outside. And what was that telling me? There's something going on on the inside. And what was on the inside eventually came out because he was slowly becoming, became more and more offended looking. So you can take a guess, but the same thing is true. Like I said, in our own lives, what's on the inside is going to come out. You can only hold it in so long. But the eye is the window to the soul. And we're either going to be transformed by Jesus Christ, or we're either going to be transformed by the world. And what we see with Jesus Christ is what was on the inside actually coming out. His deity. That's why the Shekinah was on him so I shouldn't say why the Shekinah was on him so heavily, because as we've read the cloud of God was there with him. We know that it is the Shekinah glory of God. He was there in the wilderness as he traveled. The cloud that covered the mountain that with Moses, where God spoke out of, the Shekinah was there. And everyone that I read after agrees that what this really was doing was revealing the deity of Jesus Christ because that's what was inside. And we can even look at 1 John 1, 5. 1 John 1, 5. Why would Christ uh, glow the way he did? 1 John 1 and verse 5 reads, This then is the message which we have heard of them and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So that's just more verses backing up what would come out of Jesus Christ, his deity. God is light. Why does his raiment, his clothing glow with a whiteness that no world could, this world could get any whiter? It was the deity of Jesus Christ because God is light. Now let's move on to two other figures that were with him. And that was Moses and Elijah. These two men are absolutely significant because as we're going through the Bible and studying this out, Moses represents the law, but Elijah represents the prophet. Moses represents those who have died in Christ. And in Deuteronomy chapter 34, 1 through 7, I'm running out of time, so I might start skipping over verses. But we see this is the passage where Moses actually died on this earth and that God buried his body. So Moses physically died. Did Elijah physically die? No, he was taken up in a whirlwind. So when we look at these two men, uh, Moses represents those who have died in Christ, but Elijah also represents those that will be raptured out of this world, uh, out of this world at the coming of Jesus Christ. When we look at these two men, they are also the two witnesses, are believed to be the two witnesses of Revelation chapter 11, verses 3 through 6. If someone would please read that one though. Revelation 11, 3 through 6. Out of their mouth, 
devour their enemies, and if any man will hurt them, they must, must in this manner be killed. These are the power to shut heaven and that it rain not in the days of the prophecy. And they devour over the waters to turn into blood, and to smite the earth with all the plagues as often as they will. So these are also believed to be the two witnesses of Revelation chapter 11, 3 through 6, because it's based upon the work and the miracles that they did. Shutting up a heaven, who did that? Elijah did that, that should not rain. And who turned their water to blood? Well, that was one of the miracles that God did through Moses. So it's believed, and I do stress it is believed, that these are going to be the two last, the two last, Two last end day prophets. Now, keep in mind, because we're going to discuss this a little bit later, that Moses and Elijah more likely are not physically going to come back to this world, but rather it's going to be two men that come in the spirit of Elijah and the spirit of Moses. And we'll talk a little bit about coming in the spirit of Moses or the spirit of Elijah in a little bit. So, Well, let's just go ahead and lead right into that. In Mark chapter 9, verses 11 through 13, Jesus has another discussion after with the disciples, kind of right after the Mount of Transfiguration, after the cloud departs, but before they descend below. And in Mark chapter 9, verses 11 through 13, the Bible reads, And they asked him, saying, Why say the scribes that Elias must first come? And he answered and told them, Elias verily cometh first, and restoreth all things. And how it is written of the Son of Man, that he must suffer many things, and be set at naught. But I say unto you that Elias is indeed come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed, as it is written of him. And when, the, when he came to his disciples, he saw a great... Okay, let's end there. Okay, this is not the passage that it's recorded in. It is recorded. In Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17. And let me just go back and read that one too. Just to add a little bit more clarity. Matthew 17. 10 through 13. And we're still on the... Mount of Transfiguration here. It's just Matthew's account of it. And when his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? And Jesus answered unto them, Elias truly shall come first and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias is come, and they knew not him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer them. And verse 13 is the key. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. Was John the Baptist Elijah? No. John the Baptist was not Elijah. We do not believe in reincarnation. It is not biblical. It is anti-biblical. So then how was John the Baptist Elijah? And the thing is, he came in the spirit of Elijah. And it's not Elijah's spirit but rather we're referring to the miracles that he did, the message that he came, it was the ministry that he had, it was similar to that of Elijah. Let me just go back because I did have a reference for that one too. Someone wants to read Luke 1 and verse 17. Luke 1 and 17. So, when we're looking at the spirit of Elijah, backing up for our last one, or the spirit of Moses and the spirit of Elijah when it comes to end times, we're not talking about Elijah himself, Moses himself. We're not talking about their spirit physically coming back and guiding someone. We're talking about 
the miracles that they did, because if you remember in Revelation, the two witnesses, the miracles that were listed, the shutting of heaven, the turning water to blood, that wasn't the spirit of Moses and Elijah doing those things, but rather they were miracles similar to what they did. So these two men, the end time, two witnesses, are going to come in the spirit of the two witnesses of those two possibly, and I say possibly because it's not directly clear with the two end time witnesses, but rather when someone comes in the spirit of so-and-so, they're not echoed by that spirit, but their ministry, their workings, their doings are going to be similar. Just like when the Bible speaks of the spirit of Jezebel. It's not the spirit of Jezebel herself, but it's going to be her evil workings, her cunning works that are against the children of God, against God himself. And when we're dealing with the spirit of Elijah, John the Baptist had a similar ministry to John the Baptist. His message was similar to John the Baptist. I got this backwards. Similar to Elijah. And his ministry was similar to that of Elijah with the miracles and the way that he moved about working and speaking. Now we're going to back up and close on this last note. Because a lot of people think that Peter was absolutely stupid. Now, we do know that the, the Gospels here say that he didn't know what he said, which, when we look at Peter, Peter wasn't exactly the most let's stop and think a moment individual, but rather he often spoke out of turn. In this one, we, in one of the Gospels, it mentioned that he spoke out of fear. He didn't know what to say, so this is just what he came up with. But, mo but Peter was not completely ignorant of what he said. Because if we back up, he talked about making three booths. One for Jesus, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. That was not out of the ordinary for a Jewish custom at all. Because of this reason, he was familiar with Jewish traditions. He was familiar with Jewish customs. He was also very familiar with Jewish feasts because he did them year after year after year. Every year he was alive. He took part of them. There is a feast called the Feast of Tabernacles. It's also known as the Feast of Booths. It is the seventh and final feast, and it occurs in October. And guess what the Jews do during this feast? They built little makeshift booths, something temporary. And in these booths, whether they make them out of bulrushes or whatever, they hang, each family hangs some of the crops from that year in that makeshift booth. And what that is, is a reminder of God's faithfulness and his provision. The reason that they make these little booths is, is a reminder of the temporary structures that were used during the wanderings in the wilderness, that time when God brought them out of Egypt. And the feast itself, the Feast of Tabernacles, or if you want to refer to it as the Feast of Booths, because um, Peter said, let's make some booths or tabernacles for each of you. It is a reference and speaking to a time in the future when Christ will return and dwell or tabernacle with men. And really, if we want to get, and it, this is going to occur during the millennial reign of Christ and after. However, while that is a reference to that time and possibly a reference to that feast, we all, to some degree, have makeshift booths. And you cannot get out of your booth unless something happens to you. And none of us want to be removed from our booth because when we do that means we're no longer alive. When you look at our mortal bodies, while at one time they may have been made to live forever, these are just temporary structures. Right now, these booths are these tabernacles, and that's not a far-fetched thing because the Bible does tell us, know ye not what? That your body is a temple of God. It's a tabernacle. It is a booth. In the wilderness, 
there was a temporary structure that God dwelt in. It was the tabernacle. This is a temporary tabernacle. This is a temporary room. But yet this is where God comes down to dwell with men. So we are going to wrap it up here. Does anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything they want to add? I'm sure there's much more we could pull out of here. We know that some people say it's also the one that was translated that will be the provider. Run this by me one more time. Notice that. The one that was translated? Oh, yes. When it comes to the two witnesses, there are those that believe that will be Enoch and Elijah because they have to come back and actually die before they can enter into heaven. Yeah. Yeah, that is one of the beliefs. That's. Oh, we, we don't really know. It could be more than Elijah. It I could. Don't know. It could, it could very well be. Some believe that it's going to be the physical Elijah, the physical Enoch, because they never saw death. Yeah. But really then, brother, that, that's, then that's basically stating that everyone that's going to be raptured out is going to have, have to die somewhere. Kind of a rapture death. And we won't get into that one. That was a makeup theology in Bible school to send one kid off and around because he was soaking up absolutely everything that he was stuff he shouldn't have. But the truth of the matter is we don't know who the two witnesses are. It might be Enoch and Elijah. When we look at Revelation there, it kind of points more towards somebody coming in the spirit of Elijah and the spirit of Moses. But one thing is certain. This thing's deep. And there's a lot to it. When we stand before God, then we will know all things. When Christ comes back and calls us up, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we shall be exactly like him and know everything that he knows. So like I said, there's a lot to this passage. We could probably pull out more, but that's just the overview and highlight. Anyone else want to add anything? What did that one first mean in uh, Exodus 24 when they said they saw God? Well, they could have saw the cloud of God. Because when we look because at the Bible itself says that no man has seen God. No, but when a voice comes out of a cloud, you're, there's pretty much no denying that it's somebody. And we know that the entire congregation of Israel heard the voice come out. There was no denying it. They heard it. Even if they heard just the thunderings at some point, they heard God. So they knew that the Shekinah glory, the cloud, was God. Because you got to remember, even when they came out of Israel, up until that point, out of Israel, out of Egypt, up to that point, God went before them in a pillar of, cloud, a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. They knew that it was God. They might not have seen him face to face, even like Moses when he was on the mountain, when God revealed his hinder parts. He didn't see God face to face, yeah. but rather, I believe, he showed him Jesus Christ. Because he said, anyone that would see him, he would die. Absolutely. But there was still no denying that that cloud, that, that was God. God was in the cloud. Yeah. Any other questions? Any thoughts? Like I said, if amongst one of the main things that comes to this passage is the fact that no matter how close we get to God, as long as we're in this earthly world, when we come down from the mountaintop, the devil's going to be there waiting for us. But it's not us that's doing the fighting. Greater is he that is in us than he is that is in the world. You know, we have nothing that to fear. What's that song? Nothing shall I fear as long as thou art near. Keep me close to thy side. I know I'm messing it up a little bit. But as long as we are near Jesus, that's all that matters. Constantly allowing him to change us from glory to glory. It is a transformation process. And it's continual. Because how do we know that it didn't happen completely yet? Because if it had, we'd have an Enoch experience. I'm a firm believer that we can get so close to God. If someone really wanted to, that God could say, just like Enoch, why don't you come home with me today? No, that is not out of the exception. That is not... While it may not be normal, anything's possible with God. We cannot limit Him. 
but may we constantly be striving to get closer to and closer with him and have those times alone with him. Because those times alone with him is what changes us and helps prepare us for what's waiting for us at the bottom of the mountain. Why don't we stand across this auditorium? <coughs> and Brother Eli, why don't you dismiss us in prayer? Oh, thank you. Oh,